We all look at the event pre-fight, fight, post-fight. And that's really the way we should kind of look at all of it in terms of how we're assessing fighters. What do we do pre-fight from the physician standpoint? What do the refs and judges do from the pre-fight perspective in terms of the evaluation of the fighters? And I'm, I'm going a little off topic while I'm getting this set up. But one of the things that's helpful is it's like studying for a class, knowing who's fighting, taking some time and reviewing fight films, going on YouTube and looking at fights, getting information like fight facts, looking at how many times has this fighter been knocked out, what's his record, you know, has he had 40 fights with 39 losses? Is this a guy you need to pay attention to from a rough perspective that this guy is really not one who has a high probability of winning. From the doctor's perspective, we look at that in terms of, is this a guy who's had a lot of blows, and maybe this, is, this may be a, uh, a fight in which something may adversely happen to him during the course of the event. So it's one of those things, just like in football, where you review um, film to know your opponent, uh, in combative sports and for the refs and for the physicians, we have to do the same thing. We have to sort of know who the fighter is, know who he's fighting, know what it is that they're doing so that way when we're in, we're not, it's not new to us. You know, you watch the fights, but when you're doing it and to actually kind of have an idea of how this fighter fights, what's his style, how he typically does, you know, how what he typically does is this guy had some cuts before and he's normally bleeding and stuff. If he gets hit, those are things that make a difference in terms of covering uh, the event and being able to know what's, what's unusual versus uh, standard for that particular combatant. Okay, what we're going to do is we have a little bit of time, so I'm adding a talk in. And I think it's important because it, it covers... Um, some things that are important for physicians that we need to see, as well as for the refs and judges. Uh, the objectives is to promote better communication between uh, contract physicians, refs, judges, and the ringside physician, uh, to provide awareness to potential medical problems. And we want to look at, this was for the um, inspectors to pre-fight in terms of the locker room, post-fight in the locker room, but this can go for everyone, pre-fight at the weigh-in, pre-fight in the locker room, um, fight in the locker room area, fight in the ring, fight in the event something happens, and although you're not the person clearing out the area, I mean, you're not the person in the ring taking the fighter off the mat, but participating in terms of keeping seconds and everyone else out of the ring, uh, participating in terms of helping clear a path so that we can get the fighter out of the ring. So it's all everyone working in concert to kind of help in terms of the flow so that it seems seamless to the audience in terms of what's being done. Because again, just like this is being filmed, some of these major events are also being filmed. And you know, it's amazing when you think everything is going well and you see it televised it may look like chaos, although everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. So by going over it, having a system that we do from time to time, uh, I mean, over and over, it, it um, helps in making things uh, run smoothly. Uh, this, we we're talking about banned substances, and basically what is a banned sub substance? A uh, banned substance is the administration or use of any drugs, alcohol, stimulants, or injections to any part of the body, either before or during a bout, to or by a contestant, and it's prohibited unless the drug is prescribed. So what does that mean? Red Bulls, that's a banned substance because it has caffeine. Pre-fight workout, things that you see in the gym, like uh, Jack, uh, which is a powder that people use. That's a banned substance because it has caffeine and some other substances. So these are things that you don't routinely think about. If the guy is not in a formal gym and he's training, you wouldn't think of that as a banned substance, but it's a banned substance. So it's having that awareness in terms of the rules 
and knowing what that is so that we can do what is correct and inappropriate, unless prescribed. Administrated or authorized by a licensed physician or the executive director authorizes the contestant to use the drug. A contestant taking a prescribed or over-the-counter medication must inform the executive director of such usage at least 24 hours prior to the bout. So, case in point, an example. There is a fighter who advanced from amateur to pro, and he's been fighting pro, I think, about two years now. He has exercise-induced asthma. He essentially has an inhaler that he has to use. That inhaler is a banned substance. He's turned in a medical form that we know that he has this. It's been cleared. The ringside physician has the inhaler. Then we're supposed to know when can he use the inhaler. So that's part of what, what our knowledge base is. The fighter gets the inhaler prior to his about. He goes through the event. And because we know that he has a problem with asthma, we're paying more attention to him throughout the, throughout the event. We watch him. If he has some problem, if it's not per causing him to have the fight stop, we let him finish. We check him afterward, and we let him use the inhaler again. If he gets tested, if that substance came positive or a false positive, we already know because it's something that we're already aware of. So that's one of those things in terms of communication. And even if the guy didn't know it was banned, if you hear them say something, you still need to let them know because it'll adversely affect the fighter. We test the guy, the guy comes back and says, oh, I've been on this for two months. I didn't know I was supposed to turn it in. Well, if you heard him and his trainer is telling him, oh, you know you need to take your inhaler or this, that, and the other, well, he didn't mention it to the doc when they were doing his exams, then that way it'll keep a, a title fight from being scratched because they didn't meet the rules for the state. So it's the little things like that that help um, and everyone working together in terms of doing things to see if it's okay. Um, using an example, common product that you see, over the counter, everyone uses it. Is this a ban? Is it okay or not okay? You see a guy walking in, getting ready to um, do a weigh-in. He's been training. He has a five-hour energy drink in his hand. Is that good or bad? General question, show of hands. Is it good? Bad. bad. That's right. And why is it bad? When you look down and the ingredients, what you see is that it has caffeine. If they were getting tested, it will come up positive for the, for, the, um, for the caffeine. So it's a no. You know, is this okay? Electrolyte drinks, Gatorade. Yes. It's not a problem with that. It's clear. If you see that in the bottle, it shouldn't be an issue for them using that. Uh, it contains water, sugar, citric for flavoring, sodium, sodium citrate, monopotassium phosphate and flavoring, some other stuff for stabilizers, so it's okay. But again, it's the stuff that's in the pre-fight or even in the weigh-in area that if you're not really looking at it, you can miss some stuff and when it comes time for the actual event, our post-fight and we're doing drug testing, it becomes an issue. This is a pre-workout supplement. Guys who work out at the gym, you pretty much see it. Guys are maybe talking about it. You know, I had a hard day all day, and, you know, before I go to the gym, I need to get a little something to get me over the top so that I can work a little bit harder, or I'm working hard and I really want to work a little bit more. And this is a common substance. And it's Jack 3D. And it has a black box warning, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Is this pre-workout supplement okay? No. That's right, it's a no. It has a couple of things in it. Uh, the arginine is okay, but it also has extremely high levels of caffeine. In fact, there have been some studies where people have had um, heart attacks because of the caffeine level, and it's been pulled. They've readjusted the formulation and it's back on the market, but it's still somewhat high. But again, if you don't know, just like the college players, anything that the athlete puts in his body, he's 100% responsible. It's not that he didn't know or know. Yes, Sherry? Sure.
products from GNC or health food stores are not required to list all ingredients on the labels. It's not FDA regulated. So that the ingredients that you're reading about may or may not be there in the quantity that may or may not be labeled there. But there are also things that may be in that product that are not on the label, and that sometimes gets people into trouble as well. So for example, I won't mention specific products, but somebody came in with a supplement that was high in caffeine, but also had a testosterone type drug in it as well, and failed the test because they didn't know. So part of our jobs is to, is to educate our fighters, and that starts in the gyms as well. Yes, question. Are the fighters educated um, a list of substances that they cannot take, such as the Jack 3D? Is there some place on our website to educate them so that they know in advance? We presently do not have a banned uh, substance list on, on the website, but in the rules and regulations and banned substances, we do have outlined what is allowed and what is not allowed. Now, from the athlete's perspective, the, there are organizations that you can check online that will list what's banned and what's not. And pretty much it's universal. What the NCAA requires as banned and not banned pretty much goes for pros, pretty much goes for people that are in the Olympics. It's pretty consistent. Sherry? We usually refer our athletes and say that pretty much we follow USADA and WADA guidelines, and almost everybody uh, is aware of that. So on, it's, it's a good idea perhaps to put a link and just say, look, if you have any questions. And the other thing that they tell you is if you're not sure about a supplement, don't take it, or advise uh, the athlete to call the commission and find out something about that substance prior to taking it. And just so, so that for some of the people who don't know what SADA and WADAs, you want to let them know what that is, Sherry? Yes, U.S. anti-doping and uh, world anti-doping. Yes, sir. Well, how do you handle things like coffee and iced tea, all those have caffeine in it, to tell the fighters, or do you mention this to them? And they'll often they'll go out and have something to eat, and they're thirsty, they have a big glass of iced tea to rehydrate. How do well, you handle this problem? Or well, is it a problem? I mean, the caffeine and tea should not be enough unless they are doing concentrated doses. Because when you look at what the content is in like the Jack versus what's in one cup of tea versus one cup of coffee, it's not the same. So I have not seen anything in terms of if someone had a cup of coffee coming up with a positive test or drinking a cup of tea or something like that coming up with a positive test. That's usually not the problem. It's usually the substances, like I said, when you look at the dosages in substances like five-hour energy drinks, um, Red Bull, or some of these other things that have extremely high caffeine levels, which would be double, triple, or more of what you would find in a standard cup of tea or coffee that would give what we would say, what they would say in the doping world, anti-doping world, an advantage. That it would give, the, uh, give that particular combatant an advantage over the other person that he is fighting. Yes, sir. On the issue of IV rehydration, and I know that USADA and WADA differ on that is my understanding. Where are we coming in on that in the state of Texas on re IV rehydration for fighters at, between their weight cut and the bout? I'll cover it briefly, but it's kind of one of the, it's, it's, an, it's an issue for the state that we would call it more of a uh, legal writing. Uh, presently, what we have is that you cannot have anything that is uh, injected on the pre-fight side. So that means you can't get an IV. So if you see an IV, it's illegal based on our current guidelines. So that makes it pretty straightforward. Um, we have talked about doing some further discussions because there are some, some um, camps that come in where they may have their own physician and they may do something in the room. They may do something after they've had the, um, the um, weigh in and you see IV administration. But if it's in the president, in the presence of an official or the ringside physician, it's still considered banned. 
um, because there are, I mean, when we, when we discuss um, hydration and stuff, rapid administration of fluids causing electrolyte shifts if someone has been chronically dehydrated can adversely affect the fighter and affects their cerebral spinal fluid from the hydration process, which can cause them to be at a higher risk for having concussions during the event. So again, an IV, just like in the hospital, it's a, it's a drug, it's a prescription. Um, so the present standard standing on it is anything that's injected is banned. So that sort of answers that. Uh, moving forward, drug testing, again, this is kind of an overview. It's a method to detect the uh, use of banned substances. What we presently use in this state is a urine collection system. Um, the issue that is important is chain of custody. Uh, and what that means from a legal standpoint is the chronological documentation or paper trail showing the seizure, custody, control, transfer, analysis, and disposition of physical or electronic evidence. And in our case, it's physical evidence, the urine. And by that, it means how is it collected? And that doesn't mean sending the person, sending the combatant in the stall and just letting them do it. It's observation because you can do things and give false. That's why the cups have temperature sensors on it so that you can see that it's at the body temperature. That's why the cups also have pH indicators on it so that it falls within the range of normal body fluids so that you know. It's if we're using an outside lab and they're doing it, that the physician and the ref is watching what's being listed, that the substances are split if they're doing what we call an A and a B sample so that those are there and also watching it being sealed. All of those things are done so that there is a clear trail of documentation in terms of while the, the, the um, product is in the presence of the uh, state that we can identify and account for where it was until it left our venue. So in the event that something comes up positive, then there's no question. Well, no one watched the guy pee. We heard that you know someone wasn't there. Oh, no one didn't see him that the thing was sealed. It could have been switched. No, it's a clear chain of evidence. And so it's important that all of us realize that it's just like a crime scene. There is a chain of custody. It doesn't make sense. It keeps us there long if we're collecting them post-fight, but it has to be done. Observation collection, same-sex collection. So by that, if we're having female combatants, that there is someone, either a female physician or a female representative from the state, not someone from the camp watching the collection. That's not acceptable. Yes? Are those collections done uh, by request? Who requests the collection? The, col the collection is, it falls under two categories. The state does randoms. So we have random collections that you don't know which fight it's going to be. And it may not be your fight, you know, it may not be that, uh, that uh, contest at all. That they may come in, someone from the state says, this fight is going to have a drug test, and it's a random testing, and you know the day of the fight. Or it could be a part of the contract that was set up for that event, that it was already worked out. It's a title fight. It's sanctioned under one of the, you know, under one of the agencies, and part of that sanctioning is a drug testing. That drug testing, depending upon how the contract is set up, can either be pre-fight, meaning the day of the fight they collect the specimen, or it can be done post-fight. So all of that is, you know, legal contractual things that are set up beforehand, and you know, uh, at the time of the event. Usually, not usually, the supervisor for that event is aware of what's going to be done. And he lets the, the officials, the judges, as well as the, as well as the ringside physician know that this fight is going to have a drug testing, which doctor is going to go in the back for the drug testing, which ref is going to be in the back, or, or the uh, agent, appropriate agent in the back to oversee the drug testing for that particular event. So it's, it seems pretty straightforward, but when all this stuff is going on, and you're like, well, I was watching this guy get his hands wrapped, so I wasn't really paying attention, or the doc was like, well, I was doing the other thing, 
and the guy who's working for the company collects the urine. The urine's collected, it's done, but there was no one watching it. So you basically voided a specimen. Post-fight locker room. Um, this is, again is an overview. We're going to have a formal lecture talking about concussion. Um, but a concussion is a minor traumatic brain injury that may occur when the head hits an object or a moving object strikes the head. It can affect how the brain works for a while. A concussion can lead to bad headaches, changing in alertness, or loss of consciousness. There are various signs and symptoms, all of which are important, depending upon which combination or which one lasts for a particular period of time, may determine whether or not someone needs to go from the scene or someone that may need to contact even after the event has happened to let us be aware that something's going on so that they may be able to get additional care. This talks about warning signs, but there are some things that are very important, repeated vomiting, loss of consciousness, headaches that does not improve, confusion, slurred speech, seizures, all of which we have seen through the course of, of our training in terms of, of, various, of various events. And early on, before concussions were really considered a, a, a big deal, we said, oh, it's not really that big of a deal. You see, he had a little seizure. He woke up. Yeah, that happens if you really get a bad hit. Now we know it's a big deal. Well, he can't really see. His vision's blurred a little bit. It's really not that big of a deal. It's a big deal. So it's everyone being on the same page. The doctor can't be everywhere. The refs can't be everywhere. The back inspectors can't be everywhere. But if everyone's working together, then everyone knows and it makes sure that the the overall safety of the combatant is maintained. The overall thing with all of this, and this is the key point that I've been stressing, and it needs to be consistent, is cooperation. That everyone works together. The event doesn't happen unless everyone is working together to make sure that communication is spread so that we can get uh, the combatant to be safe, because that's ultimately why we're all here.